Hey guys, welcome. Uh, well, as we continue our series on the book of Job, let me just catch you up a little bit um, on where we've been so far. We've spent so far this term uh, looking at the story of a man named Job who suffered enormously. He went from the highest heights with a happy family and lots of money and everything going well, and he lost everything in one day, not just his wealth and his power, but even his children. And now he's just in the absolute pits of despair. Have a read of some of Job's speeches. If you ever want to uh, see what it's like for someone to be in that depth, and try to understand where God is at. Here's where Job's at, at the point we meet him tonight. He says, the churning inside me never stops. Days of suffering confront me. I go about blackened, but not by the sun. He's got skin diseases and his, his entire body is breaking down and rotting away. I stand up in the assembly and I cry for help. I've become a brother of jackals, a companion of owls. My skin grows black and it peels. My body burns with fever. My harp is tuned to mourning and my flute to the sound of wailing. Job's a mess. His life has fallen apart. And he's not in that alone. He's got some friends who've come and sat with him and they've been trying to explain to him and help him understand what's been going on. And Job and his friends have all kind of come from a particular assumption. What they've assumed is that uh, because God is in charge of everything, that God sends suffering to punish people for sinning. Uh, that, that's kind of what their assumption is, that if God is fair, suffering will only happen because someone sins. Now for Job's friends, they say, well, Job, you're suffering enormously, therefore you must have sinned enormously. Stop lying, stop being a hypocrite, stop pretending that you're a good guy and confess, admit what it is that you've done wrong that's making you suffer like this. Job, on the other hand, he's kind of accepted the same um, assumption that suffering will just come because of sin, but he's saying, but I haven't sinned. And so all that Job is left with is saying, well, God's not being fair. God is not doing justice because I haven't sinned. Tonight we're going to meet someone else. Someone else turns up on the scene who's going to suggest that maybe that assumption was wrong in the first place. Maybe we don't just suffer because we sin. Maybe God has more complexity and more purposes in suffering than just to punish people. That guy's name's Elihu. We're going to meet him in just a couple of minutes. But what I want to do before we meet Elihu is look at the last speech that Job gives. Because what did I just say? Job's argument is he, he keeps saying, I haven't sinned. I've been faithful. I've been blameless. I've, I've lived following God and kept my integrity. And you know what? God actually agrees with that. If we went back to chapters one and two, God himself says that Job is blameless and righteous. So Job is a great guy. And as I was reading chapter 31, you know what hit me? I just felt challenged. Because I thought I could not say a list of things like this to say how much I love God. I, I couldn't read this list out and say, see how faithful I've been. And so as I read this list from Job, it makes me think, man, I, I could still work so much more on, on loving God and staying true to him. So what I want to do is actually break tonight up and we'll do a couple of short talks with gaps in between that we can think and reflect on some discussion questions. And that first time slot that we've got, I want to actually spend just reading through Job's speech and reflecting and thinking, which of these things could I not say, but I wish I could? Which of these things can inspire me to be more true to God, more faithful to Him? So, Job 31, grab a Bible if you've got one there, open an app up if you've got your Bible app there. And essentially, I'm just going to read through some chunks of what he says, reflecting on what it would look like for us to be more like him. Now, as we read it, you'll just have to cope with this. Uh, the kind of poetic language Job is using is that whenever he says a sin he hasn't done, he phrases that sentence by saying, if I have whatever that sin is, right? If I have done this thing, what he means when he says, if I have done this, that's actually his way of saying, I haven't done these things. Because if I had, then all of this suffering might make sense because I am a hypocrite and maybe God is holding that against me. No, every time he says, if I had done this, that's his way of saying he hasn't. Let's have a look at some of the key things where Job says, this shows how much I love God and how true to him I've been. Starting at the top of chapter 31, he says this. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. 
He continues a little bit further on in uh, verse 9. He says, If my heart had been enticed by a woman, or if I'd lurked at my neighbor's door. Right? Job says, I have been completely sexually pure, both not just with what I do with my body, but what I do with my eyes and, and what I think about. And there's a great challenge for us to start with, to say, have we kept not just our bodies pure, but our, our hearts and our eyes and our mind? Have we been careful not to fall into the trap of sexual immorality. Job says, I've done that. He continues, if we go uh, verse 5, he says, if I have walked in falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, then let God weigh me in honest scales. Right? He said, I, I'm not a liar. I'm not deceitful. I haven't been false with anyone. If, if I had, God could judge me for that. But he says he, he hasn't. What else? Verse 7, he says, if my heart had been led by my eyes, if my heart had been led by my eyes, what what that means is if I decided what I wanted based on what looked good instead of what would honor God, if I just went after whatever I thought I wanted because it would give me pleasure in that moment, Job says, then then that would be something maybe that God would hold against me. He says he hasn't done that. He hasn't let his heart be led by what he sees and wants. I don't know that I could say the same thing. What about you? Verse 13, he says, If I've denied justice to my servants when they have grievances against me. right? That is when when somebody else points out that I've done the wrong thing or I hurt somebody else. If I've denied them justice, if I've tried to get away with hurting people, I haven't owned my mistakes. I haven't taken responsibility for what I've done and tried to make up for it. Or he says, verse 21, if I've raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, right? Knowing that knowing that people will take my side, I've taken advantage of someone else. I've oppressed someone else. If I'd ever done that, then maybe God would hold that against me. And I wonder how that lands for us. Have there been people who you've wronged in some way, but you've got away with it? You haven't gone and made up for the way you've hurt that person. Or are there times when you know you can get away with something in maybe not a legal court, maybe the court of popular opinion. You know that people will take your side. And so you can kind of take advantage of people and get things from other people or hurt other people. And you know you'll get away with it. Job says he's, he's never done that. Why is it? that he's never done any of those things? Why is it that he's never looked lustfully at people? Why is it that he's never taken advantage of people? He says in verse 15, did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? In every way, Job has looked at other humans and said, God has made me and loves me and God has made you and loves you. Therefore, I will treat you the way God would want me to. And I don't know if I've always treated people that way. Always looked at everyone else as someone who God has made just like me and God loves just like me. Therefore, I will love them and value them and lift them up. Job says he has and that challenges me. What are some of the other ways that that works out? Well, he says... Verse 16, if I've denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I've kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless. Job sees that if he's been selfish with what he has, if he's had food or he's had clothes or he's had money and then he sees other people who don't and he's kept his own, that might be something which has upset God. But that's never been the case. Whatever Job has had, he's given to anyone who would need it. He says, verse 18, uh, but from youth, I read him as would a father. He's taken people who don't have a father and been a father to them. He's taken people who don't have food and given food to them. People who don't have clothes, given clothes to them. He's been incredibly generous with what he has for the sake of people who are without. And that challenges me and perhaps it challenges you. Job doesn't only talk about the way he's treated other people. He talks about the way he's treated God. So in verse 24, he says, If I've put my trust in gold or said to pure gold, you are my security. So he's never put his trust into his wealth, thought his wealth is what provides his security. Because what is it that he puts his trust in? What is it that gives him security? It's God. And he's never let his greed or his uh, love for money take over and, and make him love God less or trust God less. I don't know if that's true for us. And we want that to be true for us 
for our entire lives. So as we go forward, planning careers and planning our finances and deciding where to be generous and what money we need to earn to remember to be like Job here and say, I don't want to put my trust in gold. I want to put my trust in God. Still on the topic of how he's treated God. He says, if I have regarded the sun in its radiance or the moon moving in splendor so that my heart was secretly enticed and my hand offered them a kiss of homage, then these also would be sins to be judged. But he says, if I'd looked at creation that God has made and, and so loved some parts of creation that I worshipped it instead of worshipping God, then that would be a problem. But he says, I haven't even done that. And that challenges me, creation. Other, other people, hobbies, things that I enjoy, and started to worship them in place of God. Job says he's never done that. And that's a great challenge and inspiration for us. What else does he say? Verse 29, check this one out. He says, if I have rejoiced at my enemy's misfortune or gloated over the trouble that came to him. Job hasn't rejoiced over his enemy's misfortune. Have you? When someone you, you've got an issue with, an, an enemy of some sort, when something bad happens to them, is there a part of you that's glad, that delights a little bit when they get in trouble or when things go wrong in their life? Job says that would be something that would break me apart from God. But he's never even done that. Now instead, like Jesus says, he's loved his enemies, been, been kind and prayed for those who are against him. What a challenge for all of us. And in verse 33, he says this, he says, if I have concealed my sin as men do by hiding my guilt in my heart, because I so feared the crowd and so dreaded the contempt of the people that I kept silent and wouldn't go outside. He says he's, he's never been to the point where he's sinned, but he's so worried about what people think of him that he hides it, that he, he hides his guilt away and just pretends to be following God, even though he's got these secret sins covered up. And there's a challenge, isn't there? Because isn't that so easy for us to do? To start to sin in different ways, but to know how that will affect our parents, our youth group leaders, our teachers, our friends, and so to to cover it up. And Job says, I haven't even done that. I haven't fallen into this trap of lying to myself and others about following God. Job's list of ways he's been faithful to God is staggering, right? There's no way I could read out this whole list and say that it's true of me. I'm sure there's no way you could read it out and say it's true of you, but we, we want it to be, right? We want to be this true to God. We want to be this faithful. So what I want you to do now is to Skim back over that chapter if you want, or maybe you've written some of these things down. Go over that list of things that Job says and just try to think, what's, what's one of these that I could pick and work on being more faithful to God in that way? Maybe you could pick more than one, but, but start with one. What's one of the ways that Job has been faithful that you want to work on loving God and staying true to God in that way as well? And then once we've spent some time uh, doing that, we'll come back and we'll meet Elihu. All right, so we've had a look at Job's list of all the ways he hasn't sinned. And, and that's left us at a bit of a block, right? Because Job's friends had said to him, the only reason you would be suffering is if you're a sinner. Job has said, well, I'm not a sinner. And now there's no conversation left. So it gets to the start of chapter 32. And it says, these three men stopped answering Job. Uh, the, the conversation's ground to a halt because they can't figure out what could be going on. And now we meet another speaker. A fourth friend turns up. His name's Elihu. And a couple of important things about Elihu's speech. One, it goes for six chapters, right? This is a huge chunk of the Bible that's dedicated to this guy, Elihu. When all of the other friends speak, Job keeps interrupting to, to kind of point out things that are wrong in what they're saying. But multiple times, Elihu will say, Job, do you have anything to say? And Job stays silent. It seems that what Elihu is saying is more true and more satisfying than what the other friends have ever come up with. And in the last chapter of the book of Job, God turns up and he rebukes the other three friends for saying things which were wrong, but he never rebukes Elihu. What that means is I think it's safe to say this is the guy we should be listening to, right? This is the guy who we can really learn from. Soon we'll look at what he actually says about suffering, but first I wanna look at who he is and how he speaks so that we can learn from him. 
First thing, uh, verse 4 says this, Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. Right? Verse 6, again, when he starts speaking, he says, I am young in years and you are old. Right? We need to know this, Elihu is younger than these other guys. And so he sat back and he thought, oh, the, the old guys should talk first. They're the ones who should be wise. And then Elihu has realized something so important, which I want you guys to know tonight. He says this in verse 8. He says, it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, right? It's God's spirit in people that give them understanding. But it, it's not being young, it's not being old, right? Old people aren't necessarily wise, but young people aren't necessarily wise either. Who is it who's wise, Elihu says? It's those through whom the spirit of God is speaking, if you ever find yourself in a place where you don't know whether you should speak or whether you have a right to speak into this place, if you're just thinking of your own wisdom and trying to come up with the best things that you can think of, well, someone who's lived longer and had more experiences can probably do that better than you. But there's something that is so much more profound than just you making up your own thoughts. And that's when God chooses to speak through someone. And God doesn't just choose to speak through old people. God can choose to speak through anyone, even the youngest person in the room. So how does Elihu go about that? In case you find yourself in a situation where you think you should speak and you think maybe God's given you something to say, which is wiser than what you could have come up with and it's wiser than what other people around are saying or thinking and you think you should share it on God's behalf, how does Elihu do it? Well, there's a few things that we want to learn from him. The first one I've already kind of mentioned, he says, I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom. What does Elihu start by doing? He starts by listening. We're up to chapter 32 and Elihu has listened the whole time. He hasn't said his own opinion yet. He hasn't jumped in at any of the points where the older guys are going back and forwards. He sat and listened respectfully before he spoke. And that's a great thing that all of us who are young, there's some rooms that you're young and I'm old. There's other rooms that I go into where I'm the young one surrounded by older people. It's a great thing for us to learn to sit and listen and to actually assume like Elihu does that the people who are there know something that we don't know. And if we're quiet and we listen, we'll learn something. So you can assume one of two things. You can go into every room in your life, assuming that no one in there has anything to teach you. Or you can go into every conversation in your life, assuming the other person knows something and you don't, and you can learn from them. And granted, whichever one you assume, you'll sometimes be wrong. But which one is gonna to lead to, to wisdom and truth? It's to assume that the other people have something you can learn. And that's what Elihu does. He is slow to speak and quick to listen. But there's something else that characterizes Elihu's speech as well that might resonate with us a little bit. It says, Elihu became very angry with Job. He was angry also with the three friends, right? Elihu's speech is motivated by anger. But it's important for us to know why he was angry. What is it that he got angry about? says he was angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. Remember, Job had come to this conclusion that said, well, if sin leads to suffering and I'm suffering, that would be fair, except I've never sinned, so God must be unfair. And that's kind of where Job has landed. God is doing me an injustice. And the friends have landed the same. And so it also says he was also angry with the three friends because they'd found no way to refute Job, yet had condemned him. A lie who gets mad because these four older guys have this big conversation, chapter after chapter, hour after hour, day after day, where they all say all of the wisdom that they come up with. And all they end up doing is making God seem like he's in the wrong so that they can feel like they're in the right. And Elihu gets mad. So there is a time when it's right for us, especially as young people, to get angry. But it's not when we're being wronged. It's not out of our own self-interest and our own selfishness. We should get angry at the things that make God angry. Do you remember the story when Jesus gets angry and he starts throwing tables and plats a whip and chasing animals and people out of the temple, right? And what is it that Jesus was angry about? That God's place, the temple, was just a marketplace and people were only caring about money and what they could buy and sell. Jesus got mad because God was being dishonored. He got mad at something that would get God mad. Elihu got mad because God was being dishonored. He got mad about things 
that would make God mad. It's okay for you to get angry and to speak out of that anger if you're getting angry about something that God would be angry about. That's right. In fact, if the thing that you want to say is actually from God, then it will build up with a kind of a passion and an enthusiasm that makes it really hard not to speak, makes you use all of your patience to, to kind of hold it in while you're listening to people and being respectful. That's what it's like here for Elihu. The picture he says, he says, um, inside I'm like bottled up wine, like a new wineskin ready to burst. I must speak and find relief. I must open my lips and reply. Right? For Elihu, because it's not just his own wisdom, it's God's wisdom coming through him. And he's not just not caring, he's angry because it's something that would make God mad because God's getting dishonored by it. And he's listened and he's respected other people, but it, he just has to say something. It's from God and he's compelled to speak. And maybe one day you'll find yourself feeling compelled to speak. There's something that you know needs to be said and it's something that God would want you to say. Well, what else do you need to know in that situation? What else can we learn from Elihu? He says, verse 21, I will show favoritism to no one, nor will I flatter any man. At the point of Elihu talking here, when the young guy speaks to the old guys to share God's wisdom, is not so that he can look impressive. Right? It's not so that he can impress those old guys or anyone else who's listening. It's not so that he can say nice things to Job so that Job uh, will look well on him. And maybe if Job gets rich again, share it with him. He doesn't have mixed motives like that. And if you're ever wondering whether you should speak into a situation and you don't know if you should because you're younger and is this wisdom from God, check your motivations and think, am I actually just trying to get some attention here? Am I, am I thinking that if I say this, people will be impressed. Am I thinking that if I say this, I can make someone like me more? That's not what Elihu's doing here. Now, if we roll through to chapter 33, what's his motivation? He says, verse three, my words come from an upright heart. My lips speak sincerely what I know. And a hallmark of someone who's speaking on God's behalf is that they're not trying to flatter people. They're not trying to get their own agenda. They're speaking from an upright heart, but with integrity and speaking sincerely. And the last thing we know about the way Elihu speaks, he says, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the almighty gives me life. I am just like you before God. I too have been taken from clay. No fear of me should alarm you, nor should my hand be heavy upon you. What, what's Elihu saying there? He's saying, I'm humble. I'm just a person. I'm not going to speak with pride. I'm not going to speak with arrogance. I'm not going to speak as though I'm better than you. I'm actually just a, a normal human like you, just made from dirt. And actually the power of what I say will be the power that God chooses to give it. Will be if God is speaking through me, then, then that's what's going to be powerful. So, so I'll be gentle and I'll be humble. We're going to take a few minutes just to think about how this might land for you. If you're young, don't think that God can't speak through you. God can choose to speak through anyone, young or old. But if we're going to speak on God's behalf, let's only get angry about the things that God would get angry about. Let's be quick to listen and slow to speak. Respect other people and assume that they have something which we need to learn. We know it's from God if that passion is welling up and it's compelling us and we just feel like we have to speak. But in, if that's happening, speak, speak bravely, but don't be worried what other people think of you. Speak with integrity, speak with kindness, speak with humility, speak with gentleness and see what power God might choose to attach to the words that you speak on his behalf. See what ways God might use you to speak his wisdom and truth to change the world. All right, so now we're up to the big question, right? We've heard how Job's justified himself by the way he's been really true to God and actually maybe we've been challenged and inspired to be a bit more like Job in that. We've met Elihu, this young guy who doesn't speak with his own wisdom but speaks with God's wisdom about something that God wants him to be angry about and fired up on God's behalf but he speaks gently and he speaks uh, lovingly and he speaks with integrity. We've met those guys and now the question is, what does Elihu say? Right? What is his message that Job can't refute and which God seems to approve of? Next week, God's going to turn up and he's going to have more to say on the topic. So we're not hearing the final word about suffering tonight, but we are hearing an important word. 
So you remember the assumption that Job and his friends have been working under is that God would only ever send suffering as a sign that someone is God's enemy, right? So if you sin enough, God's your enemy. God would send suffering to punish you. So Job's been assuming that God is his enemy. And, and from that place, in his suffering, he's been crying out to God, saying, God, why won't you speak to me while I'm suffering? Right? Why won't you speak to me while I'm suffering? And I don't know whether you've ever felt that, right? whether you've ever been in a place where stuff is just hard in life, things are broken around you, and God doesn't seem to be talking. And you, like Job, maybe have that question, God, why won't you speak to me? Why do you seem like you're my enemy? Why are you pouring out this suffering on me as though you hate me? Elihu says to Job, verse 12, he says, But I tell you, in this you are not right. In this idea that God is your enemy who will not speak to you, he says, you are not right. He goes on to say in chapter 33, God does speak. He speaks in all kinds of ways. Remember, this was written before, like most of the Bible was even written. And so he talks about different ways that God spoke to people back then through dreams and visions and things like that. that, that that's one way he speaks. But then the second way he speaks is verse 19, a man may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in his bones so that his very being finds food repulsive and his soul loathes the choicest meal. His flesh wastes away to nothing and his bones once hidden now stick out. His soul draws near to the pit and his life to the messengers of death. Right? Elihu says there's, there's two different ways God speaks. One is when he he speaks through dreams and things like that. For us, we might say uh, he speaks to us through his word, the Bible, and the things that he's taught us. The other way Elihu says that God speaks is through our pain. The Job's question is, God, why aren't you speaking to me in my suffering? Elihu's answer is, God is speaking to you through your suffering. That is, Job, there is something that God wants to tell you. He wants to teach you. And he's doing that through your suffering. Now, in particular for Job, it seems that the thing that God wanted to teach him was about his pride to bring out this self-righteousness that he felt, that he would even defend himself, even if it meant saying that God was unjust, right? That that, that pride in himself was what God was challenging here. But it's helpful for us to know as well when we suffer that perhaps, not, not always, but perhaps sometimes God is trying to speak to us through our suffering. This is how Elihu puts it in uh, chapter 36, verse 15. It says, he speaks to them in their affliction. And he speaks to them in their affliction. There's a lot of reasons we suffer. We'll talk more about some over the next few weeks. We've talked about some in previous weeks. I'm not saying that any time you suffer, that's God trying to tell you something. But what Elihu says to Job, is that God is not far away from you in your suffering. Actually, he's, he's close to you and he's using your suffering to, to shape you and to mold you and to teach you so that you might become more pure and so that you might love him more. And so it's worth reflecting on suffering that you have experienced, maybe suffering that you are going through at the moment, and thinking, is there something that God is trying to teach me through this? Is there something God's trying to communicate to me through this? Is he trying to show me that I've loved something too much or that I've turned away from him in some way or that I've been walking the wrong path and, and God's actually using my suffering to speak to me, to teach me? If you're suffering and you feel like in that suffering God is silent and you wish God would speak to you, then maybe, maybe the answer is that that suffering is God speaking to you. And you should cry out to him and you should ask him to help you understand. You should talk to other people who know God and see whether you can piece together what is the message that God has for you in your suffering. Because so often we ask the wrong question. We ask God, why won't you speak to me? when really we should be asking God, how is it that you're speaking to me? We're going to spend another couple of minutes in our groups just talking about ways 
from the past that we can see that we went through hard times, we went through suffering, but God was actually speaking to us. He was teaching us. He was shaping us. We're maybe even going to reflect on ways that that might be true right now and ways that could be true in the future and how we're going to handle that when we get to those days. But before we do that, let me just pray for you. Lord God, when we go through suffering like Job went through, help us to honour you, help us to trust you, help us to, to cling to you, help us not to assume that you are our enemy or that you hate us or that you're not speaking to us. Help us instead to see that you're a, a father who loves us and you're not silent through our suffering, you're speaking in our suffering. And help us to hear what it is that you have to say to us. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.